Since December, uh, since December 2019, Ontario, New Brunswick, and Saskatchewan have been working together under a memorandum of understanding about developing small modular nuclear reactors. And uh, Alberta joined that group last year. Well, they just issued a SMR strategy paper, and I'm going to talk to Dr. Sarah Hastings Simon, Simons, who's a, an assistant professor at the University of Calgary. And welcome to the interview, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So what's your take uh, on this uh, so you know new strategy been released by these four provinces? So I think it's you know it's similar to things that we've seen before from the provinces around plans to move forward with SMRs. Um, you know when we talk about small modular reactors, um, you know the small is in reference or in comparison to um, you know the, the sort of standard nuclear power plant size uh, today, which you know in Canada is somewhere around 700 megawatts, and so small would typically be you know 300 megawatts or less can be you know, much smaller, um, and modular meaning you know either or both being able to manufacture it in a uh, factory or also, you know, kind of adding on um, bits at a time. So you can start with a smaller amount and then add more to your, to your power plant. Um, and I think that the number one thing to note with SMRs is that they are not commercially available today and they have not been deployed. Um, and they're really, you know, I think create the, the concept and the, the idea to pursue SMRs, I think it's fair to say was, you know, created in response to challenges um, that the sector has seen in building uh, large reactors. Um, and it's not clear, you know, that on a number of the accounts that the small, uh, the smaller reactors were, will actually end up being um, any better or cheaper. And, you know, I think it's you know, originally the nuclear industry started to build bigger and bigger plants exactly because of, you know, this desire to chase economies of scale. Um, and so when you look at, you know, the, the pace of um, development and the fact that the earliest pilot plants are, you know, planned for now the sort of very late 20s, early 30s, I think there's a big question mark as to um, the role for SMRs, I think, you know, it's becoming increasingly clear they will likely be um, late in terms of being able to really play a significant role in decarbonizing the electricity sector. I think there's still hope from some um, that they will have a role to play in decarbonizing uh, industrial processes. Um, but I think it's, you know, in, in my mind, it's clear that it may make sense to, to pursue development, but we certainly shouldn't put all of our eggs in one basket when it comes to SMRs. Yeah, that's a point that's made by economist Jason Dion, that there are uh, sure bet technologies like renewables and electric vehicles, and then there are wildcard technologies like SMRs that show promise, but probably won't, we won't be able to use them until the 2030s or 2040s, but we should still continue to invest and develop in them, uh, invest in them and develop them. And I think that's what this uh, strategy really speaks to. It's still a long term, uh, but there's still the provinces are still committed. Yeah, I think that's right. And I mean, the, the only the case where I think it becomes a concern with a strategy like this is where it's used sort of not as one option in a basket of things you're looking for future development where it does make sense, but when it's really used in place of actions that we need to be taking today with technologies that we know are ready to deploy. And so, you know, there's that really varies, right? It's, it's not the case that everybody that is supporting SMRs is, is doing so for this reason. There are many, you know, dedicated people working hard on this technology as an option um, for the future. But there certainly are some, I think, supporters and some that are pushing SMRs under this context of, you know, what, what some call climate delay. So really focusing on these future technology um, solutions in instead of moving forwards with things like deploying wind and solar at scale today. Um, and, and when it's used in that way, I think it becomes highly problematic because it means that you're, you know, you're not doing the things that are available today that you know you need to do. And then you're really betting on this big question mark in the future that, um, you know, again, I think there's some inherent challenges around SMRs. Um, you know, the idea that costs could come down, uh, you know, dramatically in the way that you saw in, say, the wind and solar sector. These are small, but they are still large projects. And so it's going to be very hard to get the same kind of learning by doing. You're not going to be making, you know, tens of thousands, millions um, of these units to get that same kind of cost reduction. So there's some there's some real reasons that there are question marks around that technology. Um, 
and that, you know, again, when we think about where we need to be in 2030 and 2035, Canada's commitment to a net zero electricity sector, I think it's increasingly clear that, um, you know, SMRs are not going to be able to do the heavy lifting in that space. And so we, we do need to be moving forward with other technologies as well. Last year, I interviewed the vice president of nuclear for Ontario Power and Generation, and they're working on an SMR, and the absolute earliest that they might have it completed is 2028, but more likely in the early 2030, early 2030. So that gives you an idea of the, the time frame. And nuclear power plants, as a rule, are never done on time or early. They're always done uh, over budget and over time. Oh, no, another question I wanted to ask you, Sarah, about SMRs and the oil sands. Because the oil sand burns a tremendous amount of natural gas to generate steam. And one of the things that you, and a nuke, an SMR does, of course, is yes, it creates electricity, but it also creates a tremendous amount of process heat. And wondering if that would maybe make the SMRs a logical fit for, for the oil sands so they could stop burning natural gas. Yeah, so that's certainly a proposal that has been made. And I mean, to put it in very simple terms, an, an SMR or any nuclear plant is really a way of creating uh, steam, of creating boiling water. And then you can choose to you know, turn that uh, boiling water into electricity, but you can also certainly use it as process heat. Um, and so I think the idea that you could have these smaller reactors that are creating that process heat at oil sands facilities um, you know, is one of the uh, imagined uses for them. Um, so I think there, you know, again, to me, the question just really comes with the timing there. Um, and so if we're only talking about, you know, the 2030s, just to start to deploy this technology, and, it, and if there is a question mark around that timing, um, you know, I see a risk of a mismatch between when we need to uh, really be reducing emissions within the oil sector, and then also, um, ultimately, the time at which those SMRs can really be scaled up, you know, how much demand there is going to be for that oil. Um, because actually, so Bloomberg New Energy Finance had released recently, I think yesterday, a, a set of uh, um, net zero scenarios that looked at really different pathways. And so one was very uh, dependent on um, uh, renewables, one was very dependent on uh, CCS, and then the third actually was very dependent on nuclear. And so if you look um, in that nuclear, in the nuclear scenario, but actually across all the scenarios, um, all what all had in common was a decline in demand for oil, and that uh, that decline in demand, a very significant decline in demand after 2050, um, is going to really hit the price of oil hard. And so, um, you know, even if you are able to make the say the nuclear part work or the CCS part work in the in the global energy system, um, that doesn't necessarily, or or actually what. Bloomberg New Energy Finance is saying is that that really doesn't mean that there's going to be significant demand for oil. Um, and so again, I think we'll be back to that same question of, you know, even if we can produce a barrel at very low emissions in Alberta, and even if we could do so in a cost competitive way, um, what is the market that's, that's left and what is the value of that market? And, and, you know, I think the growing consensus around all net zero scenarios is the answer to that question is that it's going to be small. Let's talk about uh, a point that's mentioned in the SMR strategy the province has released, and that is working with the federal government and nuclear operators on a robust nuclear waste management plan for SMR. This has always been one of the biggest reasons for opposition to, to nuclear, is what do we do with the waste, and we really don't appear to have a solution for it yet. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's interesting. And I mean, nuclear waste is certainly comes with a distinct set of challenges around the um, the lifetime of the risk that's associated with that waste because of the, the fact that it you know, re remains radioactive for a long time um, and, and the potential challenges there. At the same time, though, I do think that you know, the, the nuclear industry is sometimes unfairly singled out in terms of, um, you know, challenges dealing with that waste, which is not to say, you know, I think all we, we should be really being more careful that all industries are, are doing so. But actually, I think on many metrics, the nuclear industry is doing better than a lot of other industries. When we look at, for example, you know, the liabilities um, that are mounting around the tailing ponds uh, in the case of, of uh, the oil sands development, certainly 
recently the history of you know all kinds of um, industrial uh, pollution and and really sort of industrial wastelands that are left behind of many mining sites and others. So um, you know I think it's important to approach. Um, to approach the question of nuclear waste with sort of a one of you know what is the um, what is the past performance what do we need to get to and also what are the alternatives right because all kinds of energy development um, you know they they come with an impact everything that we do as humans and our ecosystem leaves an impact and so how in in comparing what that impact is you know one of the most dangerous uh, uh, fossil, one of the most major sources of energy is coal. It's killed the most people around the world in terms of the air pollution that it creates. So, um, you know, I think that the nuclear waste challenge is one that, um, you know, is solvable. Um, it does require, you know, very strong regulatory systems um, and careful rules, but, but I don't think it's, you know, insurmountable. Sarah, always appreciate your insights. Thank you very much for this. Yeah, it's great to talk to you.